This morning, if you will take your Bible and turn with me to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13 is where we will be uh, in the Bible uh, today. This morning we will break from our routine of of standing to read the Word uh, because it will be a little bit before we get there. And so uh, we will uh, we'll forego the usual uh, standing to read the Word. But this morning I do want to get started by uh, being on behalf of the mission team, thanking you uh, for your support of those that are going to Honduras. Uh, we are grateful to all those who have supported us through prayer already and will continue to do so. Those that have given uh, so much to help uh, with the financial support needed to go. And without your support, we would not be able to go and do the work that God has placed before us uh, without your support. And so thank you very much. But as we get started uh, today, I want to share with you a, a little bit about the work our team will be doing in Honduras. Now, North Carolina Baptist started a missions partnership with the Honduran Baptist almost 20 years ago. Uh, back in 1998, Hurricane Mitch uh, devastated the, the country of Honduras as the second deadliest hurricane ever in history. And it's still the second deadliest. And uh, because of catastrophic flooding, there were 11,000 people that were killed and another 11,000 that are still missing. And so since that time, uh, North Carolina Baptists have been sending teams uh, just like ours to build houses, to build churches, to do vacation Bible schools, to do evangelistic outreaches, to do medical mission teams, and just a wide assortment of ministry opportunities uh, there amongst the Honduran people. And in those years, North Carolina Baptists have built over 500 homes like the one that we will be building uh, a week from Monday. They've built over 80 churches in that same amount of time. Teams have also built a Baptist camp that is like a retreat center uh, with dormitories. Uh, I say dormitories. Uh, they're not like what we would think dormitories would be, but they're, uh, they're nevertheless, they're, it's a ministry camp there called Mount Horeb Baptist Camp where Hondurans are able to have retreats and conferences, but the teams that go from North Carolina to Honduras are able to stay there as well. And so uh, because of that camp, it's similar to Camp Caraway or, or maybe even Fort Caswell uh, in, uh, in the way that it is used. That place is a, a, a great uh, opportunity for the teams to be in uh, uh, one place where God has anointed and uh, one place that God is using very mightily just outside the city of Chulateca. And see, our team will be uh, staying at the ministry camp, and every morning we'll drive an hour south uh, to the town or the village of Cedeno, which is a seaside uh, town uh, on the Pacific Ocean. And we'll be uh, working there to uh, build a house for an 80-year-old woman named Eloisa, Eloisa Castro Carcamo and her family. You see a picture of her on the screen there. Uh, her and I think there's at least seven people that live in the home currently with her uh, besides herself. And those are children and grandchildren. And we'll have the opportunity to get to know them and to uh, work alongside some of them and minister to them and hopefully share the gospel with them. Now our team will work for six days, Tuesday through Saturday, uh, alongside, uh, or well, for those days, we'll work alongside uh, the family and along other people uh, from the community to help build uh, this house. And as we said, there's five of us going. Uh, the five of us could not build a house uh, in, in a week by ourselves. So uh, I would like to brag and say, yeah, we could do it, but it wouldn't happen. Uh, but because the work is so tedious, there's so much work to be done, uh, we, there's a lot of people that will be involved. But the house that we will build, we will, build will be a 20 by 20 uh, cinder block home, just like what you see here. There'll be two windows, 
and two doors on the opposite sides of the house. There's a cement floor inside of that uh, with a few metal rafters along the top uh, and a tin roof, uh, much like what we would put on a barn or uh, similar uh, structures here in the U.S. But in addition to the building project, we will also have the opportunity to put on a small VBS or Vacation Bible School for the children uh, in that town. Uh, the last time uh, that we went, I think there was probably, what, 25 or 30 kids, Cheryl, at that, in that village. And it was a very rural community. Uh, this is a, a little larger town, and they're expecting us to have 100, 100 kids for Vacation Bible School. So when I say we're having a small Vacation Bible School, it's small because of the things we're going to be able to do with them, not because of the size of the crowd, because the crowd will be a big number of kids. But nevertheless, uh, we'll be able to uh, sing songs with them, tell stories like Jesus and Zacchaeus and other stories from the Bible in the hopes of sharing the gospel with them and uh, play games with them. Their crafts will be coloring pages that we'll take with us from the Bible story that we'll be telling uh, on those particular days. Uh, our team will have a great opportunity to engage the culture and the people of Honduras while we're there. And we have a lot of work in front of us. As I said, there's only five of us, but we serve a mighty God who will help us accomplish it. Uh, this will be the 10th mission trip I've, ever, I've led uh, in basically nine years. And in that time, I have seen God set in front of the teams uh, an, an outrageously God-sized task. And every time God has pulled through and he has done the work, he has accomplished everything that needed to be done through those who are willing to go. And so I hope in a few weeks when we stand up here and tell you about our time in Honduras and how God worked, that we'll be able to tell you how our wonderful uh, risen Lord worked through us, but more importantly, brought about everything that needed to be done while we were there. And so we ask you to pray for our team as we travel. Pray for us as we work. Uh, the work is not uh, simple work and it's not easy work. Uh, and it will be hot and it will be humid. Uh, but pray for us, especially as we minister to the Honduran people. And that's really enough about what will be happening a week from tomorrow. Uh, what we want to really talk about now is to share what we're doing here this morning. Because each time we send out a mission team, we set aside a time to commission that group from our church and send them out. To put it in simple terms, when we commission a mission team, what that means is we're giving them the authority to act for or in behalf of or in place of us as a church. Uh, we give them that, that responsibility. We give them that right. We're giving them the authority to act on behalf of our church. We're giving them the, uh, the, the responsibility of being representatives of our church, but most importantly, they're representatives of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, this practice of commissioning teams and sending them out to go and do missionary work is almost as old as the body of Christ is, as old as the church is. Because nearly 2,000 years ago, there were some men who were to be commissioned and sent out by their church to go uh, with the good news of Jesus Christ, to take the gospel uh, and take it to people who didn't look like them and who didn't speak their language. Sounds a lot like our mission team that's leaving next week. See, this church that we're talking about had a heart for missions, much like our church does. And that church was in a small town called Antioch. Uh, what it's, it was in Syria at this time, but nowadays it's in the country of Turkey and it was in the Middle East. But see, we read in Acts chapter 13 how this church was worshiping, just like we've been doing this morning. And the Holy Spirit interrupted the service and gave them some specific instructions. So if you will, look in your Bibles with me this morning at Acts chapter 13, and we're in verses 1 through 3, and it'll be on the screen as well. It says, Now in the church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. 
You know, while this church in Antioch was having their regular worship service, just like we've been doing this morning, the Holy Spirit interrupted their service and told them to commission Saul, or as we know him, the Apostle Paul, to commission Saul and Barnabas. He told them, the Holy Spirit, he told them to set them apart for the work which I have called them. The Lord had set work ahead of them. There was work to be done. And the Lord said, these are the two that I want to, you to send out to pray over and to support as they go to do the work that I have set in front of them. God had that certain work for them to complete. He wanted the church to set them apart for that work and then pray over them and send them out. See, the Bible tells us that after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and then sent them off. So the church there in Antioch, after they had prayed and after they had fasted, they gathered together and got uh, Saul and Barnabas. They laid hands on them, prayed for them, and then sent them out to go and accomplish that work. And over the next two years, they went on, we're going for eight days. Saul and Barnabas were gone from home for two solid years to go share the gospel. They traveled more than 1,200 miles in their first missionary journey. Also, they could go and tell people that Jesus is alive and that Jesus can change their life. But see, they didn't do that until their church family had prayed over them, had laid hands on them, and then sent them out. Today, we're going to do the same thing uh, in a little bit, commissioning five from our church to go and be representatives of our church and our board while accomplishing that work that the Lord has set before them. Although it's been 2,000 years, and although travel has changed, and although our team is going to a different part of the world, the work that God has set in front of them is the same that He set in front of Saul and Barnabas 2,000 years ago. See, on Paul and Barnabas' trip, they served as traveling evangelists. For those two years, they traveled from town to town, village to village, city to city. And as they traveled, they would, anybody that would listen, they would tell about Jesus. They would share the gospel. They would, they would prove from the scriptures, from the Old Testament Hebrew text, about how Jesus was the Messiah and how He had come to save the world from their sins. They would share it with anybody who would listen. And our team's job will be, this, be to share the gospel as well. But their source of engagement, their source of connection for this very short time in Honduras will be different than Paul and Barnabas. See, the way that we will be able to engage uh, the people with the gospel is through the relationships that we're able to build during the time that we're there. As we build the house, we'll be building relationships. While we do vacation Bible school, we'll be building relationships. While we're playing basketball or while we are doing the women's conference, we'll be building relationships, building trust, and then being able to share the gospel so that those folks will know that Jesus came to save them and to change their life. See, the end results of our team's work will be the same result that Saul and Barnabas experienced all those years ago. The gospel will be shared and lives will be changed. See, one of our team members was asked by a coworker recently about why they had to go to Honduras on this mission trip. And the coworker made the usual arguments for staying stateside, staying here in the U.S. and not going. Uh, they made the arguments of, well, it could be dangerous. Or, you know, you could just send money. Or uh, you could already let the people who are there do the work rather than you have to go and do it yourself. And I don't want to say that those words fell on deaf ears, but uh, the person very kindly uh, reminded their coworker that we as believers are commanded to go. If we are able at all to go on mission, then it is our responsibility to do so for our Lord. And we ought to do it, whether it's across the road, whether it's across the state or across the country or across the globe. If we're able to go on mission, we ought to do it. This is my second trip to Honduras on a, on a mission trip. I was able to go a little over four years ago, just before I came to North Catawba uh, as your pastor. And I went there with the wrong perspective. 
not with the wrong intentions, not with the wrong motives, because, you know, I, I wanted to go and help a family. I wanted to go and minister as I could uh, to those in need. But my perspective was all wrong. And through my time in Honduras and uh, time for that experience to uh, sort of simmer in my own life, uh, I realized that I went with the intentions uh, that we were going to be some kind of godsend to uh, the people that we were going to help. That we were going to, if you want to say it, we were going to swoop in and save the day. Uh, that we were going to go help these poor, unfortunate souls that couldn't help themselves. Uh, that kind of mentality. That was the perspective. Uh, with all of the right intentions and with all the right motives. Uh, but I thought that by us swooping in to save the day and building this house, uh, we would be uh, doing you know, something uh, wonderful. Now don't get me wrong, building the house for a family is very important. And it is very needed, and it's not to be discounted. But our team is going to Honduras, and but our team is not going to Honduras to be some kind of rescuers for this family that you saw a picture of a few minutes ago. See, when we go, our primary responsibility is to build relationships. That is our primary responsibility because when we build those relationships, we're able to share the gospel with them. We're able to tell them about Jesus. Building a house is secondary. Building relationships as we work with the Hondurans is what really matters. Because we can go build a thousand homes. We can go build 500 homes like North Carolina Baptists have done. But if we do it from the wrong perspective, then we've done nothing more than just did a good work or a good deed and not impacted people for eternity. When we go and we build those relationships, as we're handing blocks to our brothers and sisters in Christ or to people that are lost, as we're working alongside of them, it builds relationships with them and we're able to share with them uh, what really matters, and that is the gospel. Recently in my daily Bible reading, God reemphasized for me uh, what we are to be doing in Honduras. Uh, we were... Uh, to go and share about Jesus as we worked and as we played and as we connected uh, with the lo local Honduran people. I knew that and I, you know, I, I, was, I was set. I was, I was like, I'm ready for that. But the scripture that God showed me when I read Isaiah 42 was like God was sitting beside me saying, this is what it's all about. Isaiah 42, 6 and 7, you'll see it on the screen, says this. <clears throat> It says, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. Now, don't think that that's talking about me or any of the other four that are going with us, because it's not. This section of the book of Isaiah is talking specifically about the Messiah, it's talking about the one who would come and save people uh, from their sins. The one that would be the savior of the Jewish people. The one that would be the light to the Gentiles and bring salvation to them as well. See, everything that we read in that verse describes Jesus Christ. Every, every bit of it. See right there, he said, God is saying, I the Lord have called you in righteousness. Jesus is righteous. Jesus is perfect. Jesus is sinless. He says, I will take hold of your hand I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles to open eyes that are blind. Right there, what we see is that he says, I'll take hold of your hand. He's, saying, he's telling Jesus, I'm going to take your hand. I'm going to guide you through your earthly life and through your earthly ministry so that you can accomplish the work that I've set before you. He goes on to say that he would be that covenant for the people, talking about the Jewish people and how he would be a light for the Gentiles. Meaning that Jesus would be the savior of not only the Jewish nation, but the Gentiles. Gentiles are just anybody that's not a Jew. And so that's the Jews and the Gentiles, that's everybody. Jesus was sent, as God tells us right here, to be that, to make a new covenant with the Jewish people. And to be a light for the Gentiles. But then he says to open eyes that are blind. Eyes that have blinders on them, sort of like horses, uh, like we've seen before, where horses have blinders to keep them from being spooked or scared. Uh, but instead, the blinders that uh, people wear that are spiritually blind means that they've been blinded by their sin, they're blinded by Satan, that keeps them in that darkness, keeps them blinded to what their sin is actually doing to their lives, and blinded to the fact that there is a Savior, that Messiah, 
Jesus. But then he says to free captives from prison. Because that's what it is. Sin is a prison. Sin holds them captive. Sin holds them in chains. They're in bondage to that and slavery to that sin. But then finally it says to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. Because for those that do not have a personal relationship with Christ, where they are at is in spiritual darkness. And what Jesus does is Jesus walks into the darkness and walks them out into the spiritual light. The light of his glory, the light of his grace, the light that is a relationship with Christ. And so as I was reading this, I, it was as if God is saying, that is what you are to share, the gospel message, what Jesus has done for them. Because everything you read there not only describes Jesus, but it describes what Jesus will do for the people that we share the gospel with here at home, in West Virginia, or in Honduras. Jesus will walk them out of the darkness and into the light. For nearly two years now, we as a church have been planning to send a team from our church to Honduras. It's taken about two years of planning and it'll be another two years before we can send another team if the Lord leads us in that direction. And uh, it's been two years that we've been planning to go share the gospel and build a house and, and do these things. Next Monday, not tomorrow, but a week from tomorrow at 3 a.m., uh, the five of us will leave from here at the church and head to uh, our, on our way to Honduras. And we'll be heading to go accomplish the work that God has uh, placed before us. So please be in prayer uh, for us as we go as representatives of our church, uh, but more importantly, as we go as representatives of our Lord, sharing the gospel that he has given to us 